Hello everyone, this is John Carey and thank you for joining us today at the Entheos Academy for Optimal Living. Before we get started, just a couple of reminders about this live event. First, we'd love to hear from you. You can chat with us uh, in the area just to the right of your screen, uh, chat with each other, ask questions, we'd love to hear from you. Also, we are live streaming, so please expect some bumps along the way and if the stream drops, we'll be back with you ASAP. So today, Eric Mazel is joining us for a class on how to create fearlessly. And Eric is America's foremost creativity coach and a prolific author with 40 plus books. We're honored to have him teaching with us. So Eric, thank you for being here today and let's get started with an introduction to creating fearlessly. What is it and, and what can people expect to learn today? I think the title itself says a lot. I think folks don't quite get that there's something scary and difficult about creating. We have so much uh, smiley face energy in the world. Everything is supposed to be easy and straightforward. And so we misunderstand that to sit there with a novel for two years or to try to move painting a little forward or to try to figure out what to compose or to try to figure out why another image is needed in the world when there are 10,000 or 5 billion photographers now, everybody's a photographer. Because that's the reality of the situation, it's scary, difficult, hard to be a creative person, and we don't quite understand that. Every individual creative person kind of knows it, but also kind of thinks that the person next to them, to their right or their left, is having it easier or is having a different experience. And one of the things that I've been trying to explain for decades now is the reality of the situation. How when we do the work and it doesn't turn out, we get sad. How facing the work and not knowing what to do makes us anxious. How because as creative people we have appetites, we're maybe a little inclined to become addicts of one sort and another. There are lots of realities to the creative life and the creative process but those are the sorts of things that I mean to talk about today. Wonderful. So let's jump into the first big idea. It's honor the creative process. And can you tell us more about that? So everybody, now I'm here in California, especially where I am, everybody pays lip service to the idea that they love process. Oh, I love the process. But in fact, we don't love process when process means spending two years on a novel that ultimately turns out poorly. Nobody likes that. Everybody intellectually understands that that's the reality of process, that probably not everything they're going to do is going to turn out well, but in their body they hate that idea. So to honor the creative process is to accept in a new way the idea that only a percentage of your work is going to turn out successfully. It's a very hard thing to get in the body because nobody starts out their current novel or their current painting saying, I guess this won't work or there's some high likelihood that this won't work. People want the thing in front of them to turn out well. That's They're going in with that energy. That's what they're hoping for. So you have to do this very intricate dance of investing in the thing in front of you, attaching to it, having hopes and ambitions for it, caring about it, while at the same time having this maturity of mind and understanding that the thing in front of you may not turn out successfully. I think the mental model to hold is the idea of a body of work, that even though we're trying to do the thing in front of us, ultimately we're creating a body of work because, and here's a Here's a headline. We have meaning needs. In order for life to feel meaningful, we have meaning needs. We, we need to seize meaning opportunities and make meaning investments. Well, when you finish your current novel, your meaning needs don't end. They don't end in any sense. So it's entirely likely that three days after finishing your novel, you're going to start to experience life as a little meaningless and you're going to want to start on your next creative project or seize whatever kind of meaning opportunity makes sense for you. So right away, the idea of body of work should attach to the existential idea of making meaning. We're going to do a lot of things in life because our meaning needs are never going to end. 
And so we want to create a body of work, some of which is going to be good and some of which is going to be much less than good. That's the maturity piece of honoring the creative process. Let me say it in another way also. Pundits who claim to know will say that Beethoven's first, third, fifth, seventh, and ninth symphonies are better than his second, fourth, sixth, and eighth. And, you know, I'm not an expert. I don't care. I don't know. But what I know is you can't do nine without eight. You can't do eight without seven. You can't do seven without six. You can't skip the things that don't work. That's what every would-be creative person wants to do. They're sitting there hoping that they can skip the thing that doesn't work and get right on to the thing that will work. They want a guarantee. And there is no guarantee. Tchaikovsky said, and this is a similar idea, Tchaikovsky said, I'm inspired about every fifth day, but I only get that fifth day if I show up the other four days. So if you, are, if you believe that the process is, I'm waiting for inspiration, that's another mental mistake. The process is really about showing up, and then inspiration will come. So that's a bit of the idea of honoring the creative process. And the headline is that we're going to hate the work on some days. It's not going to be working on some days. We have to accept all of that as part of process. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, these insights are just so useful um, for, for us in building, um, building our company. So I, my work today is very joy-filled. Well, it... Thank you for <laughs> yeah. that. Let's make a big mistake and a big mess today just to <laughs> show how folks does, how it works. That sounds great. <laughs> That's a, so, and on that note, we're moving into big idea number two, which is get really easy with mistakes and messes. What does that mean? It, it's really the same idea as the first idea, that the creative process comes with big mistakes and messes. And every would-be creative person, every creative person gets that intellectually. They just hate it as an idea. They don't want to make mistakes and messes. They grew up being told not to make mistakes and messes. They grew up being told to draw within the lines. The whole tradition, really the whole conservative tradition with a small C of education, is to not make mistakes and messes, to get things right. I think even more profoundly, we have that tradition in our, in our being of not wanting to mis make mistakes and messes. But on a daily basis, it makes sense not to make mistakes and messes. It makes sense to drive on the correct side of the road and pick up your kids at three because they're waiting and pay your bills. And in other words, it makes sense to do the right thing all day long. So here's one of the realities of the creative process is that we have to move from one kind of mind, the mind where we're supposed to be getting things right, to another kind of mind where we actually have full permission to make mistakes and messes. It's not so easy to do. It's not so easy to be doing 14 correct things in a row and then supposedly some time supposed to open up now where you turn to your novel or your symphony and have permission to make a big mistake and mess. It's not easy to go from one place to the other. It's why I think we need transitional devices, ceremonies, rituals. We need stuff to help us move from our everyday mind to our creative workspace. If we don't have a ceremony or a ritual, the whole day will go by with us needing to do one correct thing after another. And we'll end the day and just have wondered why we never got to our work. So what does this kind of ceremony or ritual look like? I think the simplest one, and it's one I talk about in a book called Ten Zen Seconds, is the idea of taking a deep breath Five seconds on the inhale, five seconds on the exhale. That's the 10 of the 10 Zen seconds. Take a deep breath and drop in a useful phrase. Obviously, it has to be a short phrase to fit into 10 seconds. And I think the useful phrase to get you from your ordinary mind to this creative space is, I am completely, on the inhale, stopping. On the exhale, I'm completely stopping. And in performance mode, I can't do it quite calmly enough, but you in your private life can do it calmly. What the phrase means is I'm completely stopping my need to get things right. That's what the stopping means there. It's not just stopping the speed of life and stopping busyness. It's stopping the need to get things right. 
if you don't stop that need, you will not be able to go into the creative space in the right frame of mind. You may get there, but you'll still be wanting to do things right, and that's a killer. One of the ways that we go in, if we're still wanting to do things right, is to resort to formula, is to repeat ourselves, is to do something we know how to do because we know how to do it right. So we make the same stripe painting or pumpkin painting or this, write the same romance over and over again because we know how to do it. And that's fine. It's fine to write the same romance over and over again. That's already an accomplishment. But if you're wanting to grow and actually create dangerously, create fearlessly, then you have to go in with real permission to make mistakes and messes. Wonderful. And and I, I'm not sure if this is connected, but how does mess relate to a creative person's life, not just in the, the work studio, but in terms of their environment? Is there a connection here? Can we, you say, oh, to, I'm fine with to, making that mess? <laughs> we have to clean up once in a while. <laughs> mm. There's a direct connection in the sense that our most highly creative... This is, let me say that the, that the general rule I'm about to say is not really a general rule because there are lots of highly creative people who are also very anal and careful <laughs> and don't make mistakes and messes in their private life. All of their socks are neatly wrapped and what have you. But I think that there's a more traditional creative person who, the absent-minded professor type, who has 5,000 papers scattered around in the days of paper. But we know where everything is, actually. It is our organizational scheme. It's not that we've actually made a mess. It's that we're, not, we're just not interested in paying attention to conformist ideas like having a clean desk or caring what the room looks like or caring if there are dust bunnies in the corner. We don't care. So I'm not sure it's the same sense of mess, but I do think there's a lot of messiness in a creative person's life because there are things that they're not taking an interest in. They're productively obsessed with their creative work and they don't want to waste neurons on getting the books in the bookcase alphabetically ordered. We don't care about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, should we go into the idea of productive obsessions and the relationship between that product, productive obsession and creating, or we can move on to big idea number three? Well, since we're here, let's stay here for a second with productive Great. obsessions. I think it Great. makes sense. Um, the word obsession got hijacked about 120 years ago by therapists. They stole the word and defined all obsessions as intrusive, unwanted thoughts. As soon as you define an obsession as a negative thing, you don't get to talk about positive obsessions anymore. And so in the 120 years of therapy, all obsessions have been looked at as negative things, which is ridiculous because creative people have known for thousands of, as long as there have been people, we've known that, the, that we can be productively obsessed with something, with our novel, with our invention, whatever it is that interests us, we want to turn over all of our neurons to that work and be thinking about it day and night, in our sleep, in our waking hours. Productive obsession is a grand thing. It's a great thing, comma, but we have to be, be disciplined enough to know how to shut it off. We have to, as the Buddha says, and we will talk about this in a moment, we have to be able to get a grip on our own mind. So even though we're allowing for and even inviting a productive obsession, we have to know that at 10 a.m. we have to shut it off because we have to get on with our day job or pick up our kids or whatever it is we have to do next. We can't be that arrogant, narcissistic, expletive deleted artist who only cares about his work. He can't be that person. It's not ethical. We may want to be that person, but we ought not to be that person. So it's great to be that deeply involved in our own work that we're thinking about it, so to speak, all the time, and that it's close to us all the time, but we also have to know how to shut it off. It's the same idea of an unmediated versus a mediated mania. You don't want to have an unmediated, unmediated mania where your brain is just racing off and you end up throwing yourself in the river because you can't stand your own racing energy. You have to know how to shut down your own manias. 
and this is work we can learn to do. This is the work, this is the odd work that a creative person has to learn how to do, how to cultivate a productive obsession, how to shut it down, how to cultivate mania, how to shut it down. These are not things that are typically taught in your, you know, graduate class on watercolor, but these are the things we actually need to learn how to do. Wow. Um, yeah, well, let's teach about 15 more classes to get through those ideas. It's really incredible. <laughs> um, thank you. And moving on to big idea number three, which is create in the middle of things. This is a very simple idea, and that is that you have to do your creating right here, right now, in life. If you tell yourself a story about how you're going to create when the kitchen renovation is finished, or when the in-laws leave, or when summer vacation starts, or when you get a residency, or whatever, whatever your story is about how you're going to create when X happens, you won't. When X happens, you'll find some other thing that needs to be done. Virtually no teacher who's waiting for summer vacation creates during summer vacation. First she has to recover from the school year, that takes a month. Then she starts preparing for the next school year, that takes a month. And there goes the summer vacation. Because she hasn't been writing through the school year, she won't be writing during the summer. James Jones, the well-known author of A Zillion Years Ago, who wrote From Here to Eternity and other bestsellers and had his books made into movies, made a ton of money. And so his friends pestered him and said, you know, well, if we had your money and your time, we'd write. So he got annoyed and he gave them money and no one wrote because they hadn't been writing. So the idea here is that you have to carve out time on each given day. And you, of course, you can miss a day. Nobody's counting a day. But basically, you have to create now and not set, set up this mental model of I'm going to do my work when life is better, when things settle down, when life is easier, sometime in the future. That's a mental mistake that costs people decades. Uh, great. Uh, so one, a question that came up around, around this idea is, and I've experienced this myself, you know, you get to the end of another busy day, your day has gone by, you haven't attended to your creative project, your creative work, and I'm wondering what's the minimal amount of time someone can take to create each day? You know, they, they've hit the end of the day, they realize, oh, I haven't done this. Can it be one minute, five minutes? Uh, how can they engage uh, if, if, you know, they're just so busy, but they just want to get their foot in? Well, we're actually jumping ahead to two different ideas, so I'll give you the headline now. Mm -hmm. Right now, we scorn small increments of time all the time. If five minutes appears or 15 minutes appears, what do we do? We check email one more time. Or we do something on the net. We go to Facebook. We throw the time away because we think it's not valuable. So one of the great learnings is that you can work for five minutes or 15 minutes on your work, but only if you've been working, but only if the work's available. If you hardly know what your novel's about, you can't really turn to it between now and the next minute and work for five minutes. But if you're steadily working on your novel, then you can do that. I think the twin goals for a creative person on this practice, to answer your question most practically, the twin goals are to institute a morning creativity practice, which we'll talk about in a minute. That's your main creating of the day. And then throughout the day, to not score in small intervals of time, but to use 15 minutes here and 20 minutes there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So let's move on to big idea number four, which is crack through everyday resistance. Can you tell us more? What's resistance? How, can, how do we crack through it? Because creating is scarier than turning on the TV or going to your Facebook site, we're just enough resistant that we don't do it. It's not like it's a six inch wall thick, six inch thick wall of resistance. It may just be a millimeter, but that's enough to make us want to turn on the TV instead or do something easier instead. And that's different from blockage, where you don't know what your book's about, or, or your third grade teacher said something to you that you still haven't recovered from, or what. This is just everyday resistance 
to doing hard work. So we have to figure out how to get over that. What I, <clears throat> what I teach my creativity coaches is that the closest <clears throat> visceral experience to cracking through resistance is to get an egg, a raw egg, take it to your workspace, take a bowl and a spoon, and crack that egg and drop it, shell and all, into the bowl. For a lot of people, they may have to do something that dramatic to help them understand that there's something to crack through on a daily basis. Obviously, on the days where you're not resistant, you don't have to do this. Everybody's had the experience of not doing their term paper day after day. The whole semester's going by. You're resistant every day to doing the simple thing of the five causes of the Civil War or whatever. And then at the last minute, because the deadline is there, suddenly the resistance vanishes or the fear rises to such a level that you do the paper in 13 minutes flat. We've all had that experience. So all of those days of being resistant, which is really a combination of anxiety, everyday resistance, existential problems around it not mattering, et cetera, et cetera. There are many reasons. But whatever the reasons are, the antidote the remedy is to know that the resistance is there and that you have to do something. Again, we need a ceremony or a ritual here. I like the cracking an egg. If you want a more gentle, you know, making a cup of tea and, you know, lighting a candle, whatever it is that you want to do to signal to yourself that, you, that, you, that in order to get started, you have to crack through something, that's what's required there. The resistance is there for creative people on most days. There are certain productive, there are the Picassos of the world who are, who are the opposite of resistant. They have a certain kind of creative diarrhea <laughs> and, and they can't stop working. They just have to, if they see not only a blank canvas, but they'll paint on your face, they'll paint anywhere because that's who they are. So that's a different sort of person, but the more typical would-be creative person is somebody who is resistant and needs to figure out how to crack through. I love that idea. I, I'm, I'm going with a yoki goodness. I think that'll work for me. Um, <laughs> really great. So let's move on to big idea number five, which is get a grip on your mind. Um, how do we do that? That seems like such a challenge, but I'm loving these ideas. This probably actually comes first. If we want to reorder life, this is probably the most important. What we say to ourselves determines how we live. What we've learned from more than 100 years of psychotherapy is how self-unfriendly our inner language is. We're tricky creatures, and so we want to fool ourselves into not noticing that we're not doing our work. So we don't say things necessarily like, I'm not talented, there's too much competition, it's too late. Those things, if we heard them, at least we'd know what we were talking about. Instead, we say things like, I'm too busy and I'm too tired. And we don't even know that we're saying I'm too busy and I'm too tired so as to make sure that we don't create today. So the task there, but the first task is to not be held hostage to true thoughts. And I'll have to explain that, of course. The fact that a thought is true is not a reason to countenance it. You only, you only want to countenance thoughts that serve you, not true or false thoughts. So what do I mean? Let's say you have the idle thought, boy, there are so many writers out there. I'm just going to let that sink in for a second. Boy, there are so many writers out there. A completely true thought, which completely does not serve you to think. And what happens is you have one of these true thoughts, boy, there are so many writers out there on a Monday, and on a Wednesday you stop writing your novel and you have no clue why you stopped working on your novel. And it was because some idle true thought that you could not shake off because of its trueness, because of its veracity, got lodged in your brain and caused this mishap. So you want to stop imagining that because a thought is true, that's any reason to keep thinking it. So the tactic that cognitive therapists teach, super simple, 
People could do it if they were willing. The first is to hear what you're saying, to listen. Listen to what you're saying to yourself, whether it's, boy, there are so many writers out there, or I'm too tired, or it's too late in the game, or the garden needs weeding, or whatever it is, whatever is going through your mind, you want to actually hear it as opposed to just having it go by. Step two is to dispute those utterances that don't serve you, to say no. No, it's not no, there aren't a lot of writers out there. It's no, that thought doesn't serve me. It doesn't pay me to think that. That's going to harm me to think that. It's that kind of no. It's no, that's of no use. And then step three is to substitute more affirmative language. It could be as simple as, no, I'm going to go show up. Or everything's fine. So that sequence sounds like you hearing yourself say something like, boy, I'm really tired. And then you go, no, of course I'm tired, but I could work for 15 minutes. It's entirely possible for me to work for 15 minutes. Indeed, if I don't work for 15 minutes, I'm not going to make myself proud today. Indeed, if I don't work for those 15 minutes, I'm going to encourage a depression. I'm not even going to know where it came from. So I'm saying more than one would say to oneself, but I'm just fleshing out what this thought substituting is about. It's about really saying no to thoughts that don't serve you. Most people do not take an active stance at all with respect to their own thoughts, and they're stuck decade in and decade out thinking thoughts that don't serve them. And so would a tactic like using 10 Zen seconds work here? Um, the example that came up as you're speaking is, you know, boy, there are so many writers. So what? You know, can we, is that a, a strategy to use in this type of situation? Absolutely. And for, for, let me repeat what the 10 Zen seconds is about. Mm -hmm. We've known for thousands of years that breathing is a useful physiological and psychological thing. We've also known for a long time that what we think matters. So in 10 Zen seconds, I did the simple thing of marrying the idea that you could use deep breathing with right thinking and create these what I call incantations just to differentiate them from affirmations. They're really affirmations dropped into a breath. And so absolutely, if, you're, if your way of wanting to do thought substituting is by breathing deeply and dropping in a useful thought, that will work beautifully. In 10 Zen seconds, I have a whole six-step centering sequence, which I can't even remember. But one can grow a more elaborate practice than just disputing a thought with a simple utterance. You know, you can make this into a full-fledged practice if that's your style or if that serves you. But the simplest thing, just to repeat, the simplest thing is to notice what you're saying, to brave. This is an act of courage. That's why we're talking about fearless creating. It's an act of courage to notice what you're saying to yourself and just to start fighting off the thoughts that don't serve you. The idea is not to have to arm wrestle them to eternity. That would be a lot of work. The idea is that ultimately you'll extinguish them because the thought won't even bother to arise because it knows you're going to dispute it three seconds from now. So why even bother? So the goal here is to extinguish the thoughts that don't serve you. If you can't, if you never get there, if you just have to arm wrestle them to the end of time, fine, because they need arm wrestling. They need to be wrestled to the ground. But the goal is not really to keep wrestling them. The goal is to ultimately extinguish them so that you're only thinking thoughts that serve you. Wow, it's profoundly optimistic. It makes you know such great sensations as we get into that practice. Um, so let's talk about big idea number six, which is instituting a morning creativity practice. If the last idea about getting grip on your mind was maybe the biggest, I don't know, theoretical key, this is the biggest practical key, instituting a morning creativity practice. Most people spend their day in maybe. 
maybe I'll write a little later today, maybe I'll write in the evening, maybe I'll paint tonight, maybe this, maybe that, and that almost always turns to no. And it turns to no for, for two reasons. The obvious reason is we get more tired through the day, and we don't have a ton of neurons left at the end of the day for our work. That's the obvious reason. But the second reason is that we've been getting sadder throughout the day by virtue of not getting to our work. We've been getting a little depressed all day long, a little blue, without even quite noticing it, because here's another day that we're not getting to our work. So most people, of course there are exceptions, but most people can't get to their creating after a long day. So on a practical level, what they need to do is to carve out a new hour at the beginning of their day, an hour that does not currently exist, and that's horrible to contemplate, when they get their main creating done. This means it being a new habit, this means it's going to take some months to institute. Not going to happen overnight. But the goal is to start your day with your own creative work. For a lot of people, this means moving their already useful practices to another time of the day. If you already do Tai Chi or exercise or journaling or yoga, whatever we could name, if you're already doing that as an important practice in your life before your day starts, you have to move it. You have to make your Julia Cameron morning pages afternoon pages or evening pages. If you mean to get your creative work done, if you don't care about your creative work, stay with your Tai Chi. But if you mean to get your creative work done, you probably need to make this change. And so the change provides three huge benefits. The first is the obvious one, you'll be working every day. Because by a morning creativity practice, I mean every day, seven days a week, because if creating is in fact one of your meaning opportunities, why would you take the weekends off? What kind of crazy notion is the weekend? The weekend's a time when we don't make meaning? It doesn't make sense to me. So if you're actually holding creating as one of your meaning opportunities, and this is an everyday practice till, till meaning no longer matters to you because you're ashes. But while meaning matters to you, then you're going to want to create every day if that's one of your meaning opportunities. And so each morning you get the benefit of getting some work done. Second, you get to make use of your sleep thinking. We'll have a whole class somewhere down the road on the idea of sleep thinking. Folks know that they dream in REM sleep. They're not so aware that they think in non-REM sleep, in deep sleep. In 2004, there was a big study by German researchers where they finally, finally somebody awakened people in non-REM sleep. We've been waking people up in REM sleep for 100 years since Freud's interpretation of dreams to see what they were dreaming about. Well, finally, these German researchers awakened people in non-REM sleep, in deep sleep, and poets were writing poetry, mathematicians were doing math. People were thinking. This has been known for thousands of years, but again, we lose all that good knowledge somehow in our general education. So as soon as you turn to the new day, whatever you were thinking about is gone. That good sleep thinking is gone as soon as we make decisions about should I have a bagel or bran flakes or whatever. As soon as we turn to the day, that's gone. If you go directly to your creative work, then you get to make use of your sleep thinking. It's there, available. The full sequence is a little different. You obviously have to go to bed a little differently, I think. I think you want to go to bed with what I call a sleep thinking prompt, which is really just a wonder. It's, I wonder what Mary wants to say to John in chapter 3. That kind of wonder. If you go to bed with that kind of wonder, then that provokes your brain to think about what Mary wants to say to John in chapter 3, and then you can have the experience of taking dictation in the morning, because your brain will be working on that chapter all night long. So to repeat, the first reason to institute this is that it's useful. You get a lot of work done. The second is that you get to make use of your sleep thinking. And the third is maybe the most important of all, and that is that you will have the experience of having made some meaning on that day already. And the rest of the day can be half meaningless and you won't get depressed. 
It's like an existential inoculation or charm or cure. And it's very important because we know that people are suffering from, to use language I don't like, this epidemic depression. I don't, we can talk about mm -hmm. depression in some other class and my belief that it's just sadness monetized. That word is just sadness monetized. But whether it's sadness or depression, a lot of people are suffering from whatever it is and one of the antidotes, one of the cures, one of the treatments is to get to your own real work first thing each day. So that's why I think instituting a morning creativity practice is so important. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to add that inoculation to my start of my day. It seems like a pretty good investment there. Um, and I want to acknowledge that there are some folks uh, asking questions and thank you for your questions. We'll come back to those about 14 minutes. We'll get towards uh, the end of the call and transition into Q&A. Uh, but for now, let's move into well, maybe idea number seven. Well, I'll talk much faster, huh? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'll talk much faster. La, 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 la. <laughs> we, ha we have a plus or minus five minutes, so um, all good, and, and we're definitely having some fun. But let's move on to number seven, which is expect risks to feel risky, which just seems so straightforward. Um, but I would love to hear more about this. It sounds straightforward. Every This is like paying service to, of course I honor process. I just don't want it to be the way it is. This is the same idea. Of course I'm willing to take risks in the service of my creative life. I just don't want those risks to actually feel risky. And this ties to the idea, and I'm going to do this in shorthand just to save a little time. This ties to the idea of how anxiety threads through the creative process. You can't get away from anxiety if you want to be a creative person. Can't do it. It's time to just embrace the reality that anxiety is going to be there. Why? Many reasons, but let me give you the headline reason. Choosing, the act of choosing, provokes anxiety. The very act of choosing provokes anxiety. Whether it's, you know, do I want the good tasting cereal this morning or the cereal that's good for me or even the smallest choices provoke anxiety. There have been wonderful social psychological experiments about just how much anxiety is provoked by having to choose. Well, the creative process is one choice after another. Put the comma in, take the comma out. Send your character to Paris, send your character to Zanzibar. One choice after another. And choosing provokes anxiety. Folks don't understand that they're staying away from their creative work because they're going to have to make choices and they don't want the experience of anxiety, so they stay away. The number one thing we do to deal with the experience of anxiety is to flee the encounter. It's the number one thing we do, if we have the option. If we have the option to not, if we're scared of flying and we have the option to stay away from the airport, we stay way the heck away from the airport. The next thing we do, and that's why so many of our Nobel Prize winning uh, novelists were alcoholics, the next thing we do is to use drugs and alcohol to quell the experience of anxiety. So because we don't want our viewers to use those two ineffective tools, namely to run like hell or to take drugs, we want folks to have an anxiety management menu that works for them. And I think I'm going to save running down that whole menu for another time, just to save a little time. But there are at least 15 or 20 categories of things you can try to reduce your experience of anxiety. And every creative person should own at least one anxiety management tool that actually works for them. Not that they've read about or that they know about or that sounds interesting to them, but that they actually use, know how to use. Because the experience of creating is risky and fraught with anxiety. And if you don't have an anxiety management tool, you're likely to just stay away from the encounter. Uh, wonderful, Eric. And one of the reasons we love working with Eric is that any of these ideas uh, can and will be turned into a class of its own. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we'll have that anxiety management menu uh, up in the next few months. Let's, let's stay tuned and uh, start to put these into practice. Um, so let's move to number eight, which is to err on the side of completing, uh, which is, this is, this one's been huge for me 
and learning to get stuff done and starting a ton of projects and you know yep. some of them make it to 98% some to 5 so how do we err on the side of completion the headline is you can't really know if a thing should be continued or abandoned that's why we get stuck because it's not possible to really know. I think there's some telltale signs. I think you get a tingle down the spine when you know it's about time to bury a project. But none of that really amounts to a guarantee. So folks are stuck genuinely not knowing whether to continue with X or to let go of X. It's not like parenting. We have to kind of stay with your kids whether you want to abandon them or not, whether you like them or not. You're kind of stuck there. Hopefully you're stuck there. But with creative projects, you're not stuck like that. You can honorably abandon them. Most folks quit too soon. They abandon their work too soon. They don't give themselves the experience of doing the thing all the way to the end, having what Anne Lamott calls a shitty draft in, in whatever genre you're in, doing the revision work, doing the revision work, calling it complete for now, showing it to other folks, being brave, accepting those risks, getting pushback and feedback from the world, getting pushback and feedback from marketplace players, and actually understanding the process from beginning to end. Most people don't go through that whole cycle. They throw things away too soon for all kinds of reasons that we can do our whole class on why it's hard to complete. So there are tons of reasons why it's hard to complete. And that's why the headline is, rather than going through all the reasons and, and sort of addressing them one by one, just err on the side of completing. When you come to a choice point where you say to yourself, this thing sucks, don't have your next sentence be, and so I'm putting it aside. Have your next sentence be, but nevertheless, I'm giving it another day, week, month, I want to try to get it done to see what I really have. We're going to be saying to our, it's one of the dirty little secrets of the creative process, many times during the day, week, month, we're going to be say, saying, I hate this thing. It's just not turning out the way I meant it to. So for all of those times, we're going to be inclined to stop. And because we're inclined to stop, we have to be speaking to ourselves in a certain way, and that certain way is, no, I'm getting to the end. Obviously, if you should abandon it, if you're on your 14th year working on your memoir and you're still on page 18, probably something's not working there, and probably you should move on to something else or, or change your methods. So obviously, if you are struggling with a piece and it needs to be put aside, put it aside. I'm not saying complete everything you start. That's absurd. What I'm saying is err on the side of completing. Try to complete more things than you abandon. Wonderful. So I'm just going to jump straight into number nine. Um, and number nine, and there's so much more work you've done around this as well. But it's let meaning trump mood. Um, such a profound idea. Can you can you elaborate on this? Yeah. We've gotten into what I think is the unfortunate habit of caring so much about what mood we're in, as opposed to caring about what meaning we're intending to make. And so that's what that phrase means. The phrase means think more about the, mood, the meaning you're intending to make than the mood you happen to be in. I'll give you a simple example, about as simple as it comes. In the days before D-Day, we do not care what mood Eisenhower is in. We don't care if he's anxious, we don't care if he's depressed, we don't care if he's annoyed. We just want him to make D-Day work. That's important for all of us and important for him. Now, most people don't feel like their own work is the equivalent of D-Day, the equivalent of an invasion. But we should. We should be moving our mind toward the idea that our meaning investments are as important as our little D-Days. They are our D-Days. They're our ethical stances. They're the things we do that are important to us. 
given that they are important to us or that we've, we're holding the intention that they're important to us, then it should matter less what mood we're in than it would matter if we didn't care about life. One of the proofs that we're caring about life, caring about our life, is that we're doing our work in the face of whatever mood we happen to find ourselves in. Wow, that one gave me chills. <laughs> um, amazing. We went to the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. this year and saw the quotes, the inscriptions on the walls and um, I haven't really thought about our own personal D-Days, but uh, absolutely yeah. incredible. Um, so let's move into... Before, before you, before you yeah. go on to 10, yeah. this one as a personal one-second anecdote. I, when our younger daughter graduated from high school, um, I took her to Paris as a treat. And so we had the option of crossing the um, English Channel in many ways. And I wanted to go on one of those bumpy ferries just to have, just to have her have the experience of what one of those boats crossing the channel might have felt like. Yeah. So even though there were easier ways to cross the channel than that bumpy boat, I just thought that was important to do. Because for me, that's one of our momentous good things, D-Day. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I love the idea of just taking the symbol of it and recreating it for yourself. It's kind of like the egg ritual, you know, those, mo yes. those moments and being creative in those moments. Um, wonderful. So our final big idea is getting smart about the marketplace and how to advocate it, for, for your work. Does it, <laughs> doesn't sound like a small one, does it? Not at all, and I hate we to constrain it. <laughs> We haven't talked about the marketplace really at all yet, except in the sense that, of course, it provokes anxiety. We've been talking about the creative process per se. But for most Western people, I don't think we're, you know, Eastern monks who can make sand paintings and then blow them away. We actually want what Virginia Woolf called an echo. We want an audience. We want a reception in the marketplace. As Western people with, you know, egos and drives and ambitions and what have you, we not only want to do our work, but we want our work to be out there. Most artists don't want to do that piece of the puzzle. They keep hoping and dreaming that there will be some intermediaries, some gatekeepers, some helpers, some advocates who can do that work for them. But it turns out, and more and more all the time, it turns out that we typically have to do that work ourselves. And so there's lots of psychological preparation we have to do to, to do that work effectively. There's practical preparation, which we can spend another class on just how to prepare yourself practically to put your creative work out in the marketplace. But psychologically, you have to embrace that criticism is coming, that rejection is coming, that silence is coming, that dashed dreams are coming, that things that you do not want are coming. If you're trying to hold that, okay, I've made a thing, now let me have this wonderful experience of putting it out there, well, you probably won't because you will secretly know in your heart of hearts that it's not going to be a wonderful experience, that it's going to be an experience fraught with reality, and so you may not want to do it. So you have to start building your thick skin right now and doing your good pseudo-Buddhist work, your good detachment work right now, you want to have been attached to the work all the way through in the sense of caring about it, wanting it to turn out well. Here you have to let it go, stop identifying with it, stop being the equivalent of your novel so that when it's rejected, you're rejected. You want to stop doing that work and understand that you're putting it out in the marketplace and that every single creative person from the beginning of time gets criticism, rejection, and a lot of silence. So I think that's, I think I'm just going to say that simply with a period so that we have a little time for questions. And the simple thing to say there with a period is, here's another place to be mature. Just understand that you're not alone when you get rejected and criticized. We all do. Get ready for it. Learn how to deal with it. Figure out your own preparations for dealing with a particularly nasty rejection or criticism. Figure that out, but don't let that coming reality stop you from dealing with the marketplace. Wonderful. And I want to jump into questions 
and answers in just a moment, but uh, there's still one question here that I think would be really useful, which is, you know, there's a lot that we've gone over today, a lot to think about, but what's the top practical tip um, from all the things you've talked today? What's something people can just take with them right now, put it into practice? I'm going to say this really simply because most people have enough objections to the morning creativity practice that they're going to not do it, even though I'm saying it's the most important practical change to make in your life. <clears throat> so I'll take your question as the opportunity to just repeat that instituting the morning creativity practice is the biggest change you can make for yourself. It'll make all the difference in the world. If you fail on a given morning to get up, then you have to do those twin things that we do when we fail, and that is to forgive yourself and recommit. That's what this process is of instituting the morning creativity practice. If you, if you happen to just pull it off, wonderful. If you don't pull it off at the first go, forgive yourself but recommit because it's going to prove super valuable to you to get it down over time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So. Some questions have been coming in from the audience, and uh, thank you guys for your patience. Um, one of the questions is, how can we tell the difference between our own messes and boundary-breaking success? <laughs> Boy, I'm not even sure how to get into that question exactly. I, I, I think I'm going to say a thing which is over simple and, and too, doesn't really answer the questioner's question. But we have to learn things for ourselves. Virtually every question that I get asked, somebody wants the rule or the principle in reply. They want to know the rule or the principle. And almost always I have to say there can't be a rule or a principle. It isn't that creating in the morning is better than creating in the evening, or making a super large mess is better than making a super small mess, or doing formulaic work is better or worse than doing. There can't be rules or principles. Each individual has to figure out what's true for themselves what works best for themselves, and what's ethical for themselves. I think the question of value is not raised often enough by the by individuals, by all of us. And so we just have to, we have to be true to ourselves. It's it's not a really satisfactory answer, but I think I have to give that answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, this is a great question. So if you have all uh, creative projects, but you convince yourself that you need to learn something first before you get started. Um, how do you turn into a, an same action oriented? Same answer. Yep. <laughs> it's the same answer because if you really need to know how to use this quill pen, you need to know. If you need, if you need to know how to use a process, a technological what have you, you obviously have to know how to use it before. On the other hand, if you've been researching the the color of Berlin trees for the last 19 years because you don't want to write that chapter, that's something else again. There can't be a principle about please don't research or please research. There can't be a principle there. There can only be personal honesty. Things come up where we have to learn a thing first. I do think I would err on the side of using your own wisdom and not taking another workshop. I would err on the side of trying to actually do the work as opposed to taking another workshop. But conversely, I have to say that if you need the workshop, you need it. So that's, it's got to be that kind of answer. You have to be true to yourself. Great. And the next question um, is sort of around the multiple roles we play in our creative work, from yes. writer to entrepreneur. And so if you have more than one love, um, you know, how, do you, how do you keep these multiple loves going in your busy life? There are many ways to think about that, but I want to say a simple one. If you buy my idea, and I'm going to do a little horizontal thing, if you buy my idea of a morning meaning practice, let's consider that sort of horizontal, like every day of the week you're spending that hour, your brain doesn't really want to do two big things on the same day. It's very hard to write in the morning and paint in the afternoon. Very hard to do that. So if you horizontally do your writing each day, what you can do on is on Friday evening, you can give yourself the sleep thinking prompt, boy, I wonder what I'd like to paint tomorrow. And then give yourself, and this is now a vertical thing, give yourself all day Saturday to work on your second love, to paint. And by organizing life this way, you can maintain a main creativity practice, like your writing, let's say, but also have a way to get a secondary one, like your painting, on your plate. 
and this works for many people. There's no ideal solution. The grass is always greener. If you're writing, you want to be painting, and if you're painting, you want to be writing. The grass is always greener. But this is at least a way that works physiologically. It works the way your brain wants to work. Your brain wants to work on one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. So this way you're giving your brain the chance to work on your novel, let's say, for five days, and then turn itself over to another interesting thing for at least the next 12 hours. Wonderful. So get those line items in there and uh, <laughs> do it first thing. Um, a lot of questions are along the same lines of self-discernment, self-awareness. So I don't know if I want to yeah. dive too much into those, but um, I'm wondering, could you give us one example of an anxiety management technique? Sure. And of course, we'll come back to this uh, over time. Um, let me choose, as I say, there are many categories. So I'm going to choose one category, and they're called discharge techniques. Because anxiety and stress, in other words, that we use build up in the system, we want to physically get them out. Part of flying anxiety is actually what's called inhibited flight. It's, it's feeling trapped in those little chairs, in those seats. It's not just, why does this plane take off, but it's also, I'm trapped here. So one of the tricks in the creative life to deal with that feeling of inhibited flight and to discharge anxiety is to simply get up and walk around your chair. This sounds super simple, but as soon as you get up, you release the sense that you're trapped in front of your computer screen or trapped in front of your canvas, and you reduce your experience of anxiety. One of the discharge techniques that I like a lot that actors often learn is what's called silent screaming, where you make a big screamy face. <laughs> yeah. And that you can't really scream because the police come and all of that and you have ec extra problems on that day. But you can do silent screaming. And that's the idea is to do something physically dramatic or simple that releases the bile, that releases the hormones, that releases the chemicals. So that's just one category of technique, discharge techniques. Wonderful. Thank you. And so we're coming up on the last couple of minutes um, of this class. And so I, maybe we can take this opportunity just to point to some more resources. And, and Eric has a, a book on, on pretty much every uh, subject in this <laughs> class. An additional 200 pages you can go read. Um, as I mentioned, he has 40 plus books. So Eric, can you point us to some resources from uh, where can people go to learn more? I think I will. I think that's great to have you ask me that. Um, if you experience what I would call existential sadness, you may be calling depression in your life. I would recommend a book of mine called The Van Gogh Blues, which is which talks about the relationship between creating and mattering and existential sadness. So if that's an issue for you, that's a book for you. I've done a second book in this area of sadness-depression called Rethinking Depression. And those two books together, I think, would give somebody suffering from what they were probably calling depression a lot of help. With anxiety, the, the two books I would recommend, an older book called Performance Anxiety. So if performance anxiety is your anxiety of choice, then I would recommend Performance Anxiety. But the more recent book is called Mastering Creative Anxiety. And I would highly recommend that book for really for everybody. Because in it, I have all of the anxiety management techniques that we will be talking about down the road with lots of examples and what have you. So I think that's a particularly useful book for folks. If your appetites have angled you in the direction of addiction, any kind of addiction, even what isn't exactly considered an addiction, but things like um, distraction addictions like too much internet and too much surfing and what have you. If you're holding that you're maybe addicted to something, I would recommend my book Creative Recovery, which I did with an addiction spe specialist by the name of Susan Rayburn. And it's the first and only actual recovery program for artists. It actually takes into account our needs as creative folks, including sort of how much creating is safe in early recovery which is an interesting question. So for 
depression, addiction, and anxiety, those are some headline books. I think that's probably enough for uh, listeners to take in. <laughs> yeah, just for the next few years. That's, that's all. Um, great. Uh, well, thank you, Eric. Really appreciate your time today. And uh, we hope the folks will come back tomorrow. We'll be teaching a class on how to cure your hormones with a fork with Sarah Gottfried, MD, at the same time. And please remember there's a new class every single day. We'll be archiving these classes forever, including coming back uh, soon with another class with Eric. So please tune in and we'll keep it going. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Eric, for being here. Hope your day is wonderful. Thank you, John.